Good evening, guys, and uh, welcome uh, from not so sunny Alberta, Canada. My name is Feta Silverman. Someone know me. Someone know. Someone know uh, me as Dr. Sveta Silverman. So today is not about me. But let me tell you something. Why was I so so excited to talk to uh, uh, to Marco? and uh, ask him to share what he achieved and what he wired. So guys, now let me remind you that I'm a double graduate from medical school. And guess what? In both medical schools, we were taught that nerve cells do not regenerate. And uh, when nerve cells are gone, they're gone. So we don't have more of them. However, through my uh, learning and uh, basically studying all the time, what I have discovered that I think some say that uh, even, even whatever we have for nerve cells uh, is plenty because we only use like about 20% of them. But it's not only about nerve cells, it's about we can have nerve cells, but we, can, we don't have if we don't have the conductivity or connection between them. So there is no impulse and there is no message. So there is another thing that I was kind of taught in medical school and being an ex-surgeon, that kind of makes sense to me. If someone has a ruptured aneurysm in the brain, a ruptured aneurysm, aneurysm means a pocket, a dilatation of the blood vessel that is weakened, so you kind of like a pocket, like a diverticulum of the uh, blood vessel. And if it ruptures, there is a bleeding in the brain and by and large, it's fatal. And if it's not fatal, it leads to very severe consequences as disability and stuff. So that is why when I mean, initially, when we heard about Marco Rodriguez and what happened to him, and he will tell you the story, it was devastating. We were all praying. That's to another story. That's to another thing, the power of creator and the power of us coming together. But without further ado, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Marco's bio. He is an occupational therapist. Uh, with his wife, Diane. And to be honest with you, I really need to do this. I need to bow. I need to bow to Diane. What he did in that time of adversity and at that time, yes, yes, Kathy, in that time when Marco was on ventilator, when he was in perils, when he was in the hospital, Diane was his rock. No offense, but some babies. So, so both of them, it seems like they are OTs, occupational therapists, extraordinary because their clinic functions conventional, unconventionally. And indeed, uh, I met Marco and Diane through uh, Life Vantage, the supplement company, which we're not going to talk about supplements. We're talking today is Marco's time. So Marco, so let me tell you something. So what happened, and he will elaborate. Uh, on the 3rd of July, 2021, we got devastating news that Marco Rodriguez suffered a massive brain bleed. Uh, Marco, Diane, take it from there, from here. Thank you. And thank you guys. So honored to have you on Zoom. Thank you, Sveta. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and, and it's an honor to be able to share my story on your, on your call. Um, so yeah, so Diane and I are both occupational therapists, and uh, on July 3rd of 2021, we were vacationing in uh, South Padre Island, which is just right off the coast of Texas. We were taking uh, my two, my twins, which were graduating from high school, and my granddaughter, who was finishing up eighth grade, going into her freshman year of, of high school. And so we thought we'd be, and 
good idea to take them on a little trip to South Padre. And we were just like any other ordinary day. We had gone swimming uh, the day before out in the ocean. Uh, I mean, everything was great. Life was good. And then on July 3rd, uh, early in the morning, I received what I was, you can only describe as the most painful headache that I could ever imagine. And, uh, and I started to get a little woozy, a little dizzy. And I knew, I thought, boy, this is not going to be good. Now we were in a hotel room and I was at the other side of the hotel. And I thought, I know I'm gonna pass out. So I need to make my way over to the bed so that I can just lay down there. Cause I didn't want to fall and, hurt and hit myself and hurt myself. Well, I never made it. Uh, I collapsed uh, just short of the bed. And uh, it's almost a good, uh, a good thing that I did collapse because when the thud that happened when I hit the floor uh, woke Diane up and uh, she uh, immediately called uh, dial 911. And of course they whisked me away to uh, a hospital in Brownsville, Texas. Fortunately, I say fortunately that if I collapsed before I got to the bed because had I fell asleep or landed on the bed and Diane had not heard, I probably would have just bled out. Um, so they rushed me to a hospital in Brownsville and um, come to find out, and Diane knows more of the details, but the, the, the short story is that I had a massive bleed. I received 10 titanium coils encapsulation and uh, the neuro neurologist says that over a third of the people who have uh, what I had, the size bleed that I have, don't survive. They're uh, dead on arrival, DOA, dead on arrival. And another third that do make it to the hospital usually don't survive uh, for over the next few days because of vasospasms spasms and a lot of other complications. And so I am very fortunate. I appreciate everyone's prayers that got me through this. Uh, and I'm certainly glad for the things that I did before uh, digging the well before I was thirsty, if you, if you know what that means. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. So basically the story, uh, he's right. And the thing is what he told me, the bleed happened in one of the major brain vessels. You know, for some in medical field, it's a posterior cerebral artery. That's, that's a very significant cerebral artery. And one of the sequelas that it controls that part of posterior part of the brain, which controls the vision. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, we were praying. So Marco, you were on ventilator? I, I was not on a ventilator. I was in ICU for uh, over two weeks, uh, but I didn't, I was never on a ventilator. Now, what were the what were the sequelae per se when you uh, came out? You regained consciousness. What did you lose? Because today we're going to talk about the concept that is called neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. or regaining the functions and the multimodality of those different functions. And exactly what Marcus said, you got to be proactive and retroactive and anticipate a lot of things. So initially, what were the symptoms? What were, what was, you know, what did you lose? What functions did you lose for you to regain? Yeah, well, in addition to the, you know, to the acute uh, issues, which were of course, uh, massive amounts of uh, fever, uh, hallucinations, uh, lots of that. Um, I was very weakened. Uh, I had a lot of uh, just uh, generalized weakness. Uh, of course, the vision issues. And uh, I was fortunate that I didn't lose uh, my speaking abilities. Uh, again, if you know anything about it, which I'm sure you do, uh, but the posterior cerebral artery, when it ruptures, it doesn't really have anything to do with, uh, with the speech pattern. So my speech patterns were not, but my vision was and I had, I had a lot of weakness. So uh, initially I uh, was using a walker and balance issues were way off. Cognitively, um, memory was terrible. Orientation was, uh, was uh, way off. Um, gosh, I, and, you know, I, I wish I could go on and on about some of those issues, but that's, that's for the most part, I would say the uh, cognition, uh, vision, and a lot of weakness, uh, a lot of that I'm still uh, working in the process of working through. Uh, when I came home, I was using a walker and uh, 
just, I, it was, it, I, I can laugh about it now, but sped up. You know, I've lived in the same house for over 15 years. And when we first came home, um, I was using a walker. And I don't know why my, my judgment, my orientation was really off. And for whatever reason, I thought that I could go out for a walk on my own. I went around the block and I was so disoriented, I got lost and I couldn't make my way back home. And I eventually just started walking. I figured I'll find a street that I, that's recognizable to me and I'll just try to see if I can find my way back there. But it took me over 30 minutes just to go around the block. That's how uh, badly my orientation was. Uh, before we start getting to the patterns of recovery, what you have done, what are the modalities, what was the predicted outcome from your physicians? Well, I've had several um, different. One of them, of course, was that uh, you know the the mortality rate, which is extremely high uh, for persons who had uh, you know a, a bleed as large as I did, and I also got a report initially from a uh, neuro ophthalmologist who came to examine my my vision and a few other physicians who said that that was it it was not going to get any better that anything after the first couple weeks that was it i wasn't going to get any other progress back uh okay so uh again guys we as doctors we don't have the crystal ball uh, I may be the one actually who has a crystal ball right there. You see that? And I'm just joking. So uh, anyway, so we as physicians, we make sort of, you know, we keep prognosis going and stuff. Of course, you know, there's literature and stuff. But as you see on Marco, hope, trust, and believe. Okay, Marco, uh, uh, run us through the patterns, what you have done. What empowered and rebuild yourselves and what rebuild the connections? So I've had, uh, you know, extensive therapy, inpatient and outpatient rehab, uh, including neurofeedback and, and other physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Uh, but I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough that I had learned about the power of NRF2, uh, NRF1, and so I'd already been what I call a, a biohacker uh, prior to this. And what was interesting is that I was unconscious, but Diane reported back to me that the neurologist, when he went to go give Diane the initial report, you know, he explained the size of the bleed and that he said that he was amazed that my brain, it seemed like my brain was already going into healing mode, into repair mode. Now, Diane was so surprised by that and she didn't really stop to think or ask him what he meant by that. But um, I, I can say that at least my personal testimony is that compared to what others have gone through and compared to what my current neurologist is completely amazed at how quickly my brain is recovering, I think I'm doing okay. I think I'm doing- Yeah, I think so. So, so let me, so guys, so let me tell you something. Sort of from a cell, I'm not a neurologist. I'm definitely not an ophthalmologist. We actually have an ophthalmologist on the call and she can probably share some wisdom what happened when the posterior cerebral artery is ruptured. Thanks, Amy. Uh, the, but what happened to the cells, and especially in this situation, now, let's say we're talking, what, is the, what does the brain need? The brain needs oxygen, mm -hmm. right? The brain needs oxygen and the brain needs food. Well, in this case, most of the uh, most of the food actually for the brain, the majority, about 70% is a glucose. But don't start eating sugar right away. But the thing, but the thing what happens, why? Because of the cellular activity of the neurons or the brain cells. And the brain cells are the ones, because they're so active, brain is only two to 3% of the body weight consuming 20% of the whole oxygen, of the whole air slash oxygen we breathe. Mm -hmm. 
So those cells, they're probably the, you know, whatever, they, the hardest working bees, and they contain the majority of mitochondria to give that energy, that power for us to think and function. So for example, to give an example, uh, some of the brain cells contain over 2 million of mitochondria. Comparing to the skin cell, which contains about seven mitochondria. That gives you an idea. So what happened when the ner nerve cell is damaged, neuron is damaged, and that mitochondria is, doesn't get the energy, it's leaking. It's leaking, it's broken. So how does the repair happen? Why are we talking per se NRF2 and mitochondria? So when that cellular damage happens and cellular per se rapture happens, the repair happens through glutathione or one of the repairing mechanisms happens through glutathione, which is the master cleaner, master antioxidant of the cell. So cells are smart. They want to get rid of the garbage as soon as possible. The problem is in Marcus case, there was so much garbage because when, when there's a bleeding, there is a cellular damage and cellular destruction. Blood is very kind of, you know, le uh, bleeding, you know, open, open blood is very reactive. It's almost corrosive. So, you know, the glutathione is gone very fast and there is nothing to replete it. So for us to be so proactive and start building it back, or actually having the cells, the surrounding cells, the capability to share, because the cells are actually share the mitochondria, there is connection. So there's a little bit to that proactivity. So now, okay, so Marco, you told us about, let's get into multimodality. How did you exercise? Was it strenuous? How did you start, you know, getting better and better and better? Well, initially, uh, I couldn't even, I could hardly walk. I, I won't say that I couldn't walk, but I was using a walker and I could, uh, I remember the first time I tried to get out of bed and I tried to walk less than 10 feet and my muscles, everything just contracted and I nearly collapsed. So I started there and it was just simply getting out of bed, uh, standing, just just standing. That was enough to, to really to just make me feel worn out. And then eventually from there, I started taking a couple steps and then just a few more steps. And then, of course, uh, working with uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, along with speech therapy, just little by little, doing a few more steps and a few more steps. And then some upper body uh, exercises, of course, uh, speech and language pathology to, uh, uh, to work with my speech patterns, to work with my cognition. Uh, so all of that, and it's been now about six months now. And were you uh, pushing yourself every day? Say again. Were you pushing yourself every day? Never give up. Oh, of course, of course. I, I you know, and and I've always been a, a rather introverted personality type, but I'm also a type A. So I push myself at everything that I do, and because. Uh, I, you know, I spoke with, uh, with our, our mutual friend, Carrie Williams, and, you know, and I said something to her, and as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, what did I just say? Because now I've got to live it. And I told her, I said, this is just another opportunity for me to become legendary. And I thought, why would I have said that? That was not... He said, you are legendary. Marco, you need to understand, you are paving a way to millions and millions who needs to hear your story. Now, let me ask you another question. I'm sure. sorry to interrupt you. Absolutely, I agree. Plus, well, Kerry Williams is a legend. Any which way we put it, Kerry is a legend. So anyway, let me ask you a question. Through exercise in being that fatigued and tired, how did you manage to fight the fatigue or something? How did you, anything that you added, how did you kind of push yourself? What were your tricks? What were your tricks to push yourself a little bit more every day? That's a great question. And, and you know, um, yes, I did push myself, but I also knew that I needed to get adequate amounts of rest. 
But I also needed to make sure, and I, I learned this very early on, I've always been very active, and I knew that the body needs to be fed the right uh, natural compounds. And so for me, I knew that I needed to put the uh, NRF2, the NRF2 activator into my body in order to, as you said, described earlier, activate those enzymes, glutathione, catalase, superoxide dismutase, in order to remove a lot of the toxins, a lot of the oxidative stress. You know, when I talk to my patients, I, this is how I describe it to them. If you're driving on the highway and it doesn't matter if you have a Lamborghini or an old beat up car, if the highway is full of trash, we're all going to go the same speed because there's too much garbage on the highway. So what the NRF2 did for me is, and, and there's all the research, and, and Sveta, you know all the research behind it, is it cleared out a lot of those toxins in order to give my body the, a better opportunity to begin the healing process. That was step one. I started uh, with the NRF1, NRF1 activator, which of course helps to boost or put your cells into a state of mitochondrial biogenesis. Well, as we, as you described earlier, the mitochondria is so important. Uh, it's about 10% of your total body weight, and it is up to 90% of your body's energy. So in order to have that, and of course, the brain has the most number that I know of, the brain, and I think the heart's up there as well, but the brain has the highest number of mitochondria uh, of any cell in your body. And when you start to lose the mitochondria in the brain, you're going to know it. Uh, as opposed to if you lose a mitochondria in your skin cells, you may, it may not affect your life quite as much. So by active, act, putting that NRF1 activation into my body, uh, it certainly, I believe it certainly helped my brain cells to have those engines in order to be able to uh, start to function again. But the interesting thing, what you said, mitochondria is, it's an interesting thing, absolutely. And a mitochondrial biogenesis, AKA making more mitochondria. But the interesting thing is it's not enough per se, especially in your case, just to start boosting both activator of mitochondria as an NRF1 and some other factors like PGC1 alpha or something like that. But it's actually, it, it, so we, we're activating the the making the new ones but then we we needed to start regaining the old ones so from this perspective not only for example we we kind of need something that cell you mitochondria utilizes into that functionality so you need that coenzyme q10 that's the function of mitochondria you need the carnitin you need that uh, alpha lipoic acid or alpha lipoic acid. You, um, but what you also need is, and that's what Marco was doing, you need the exercise. You need the continuous exercise. And sometimes you need actually a strenuous exercise. Mm -hmm. And then per se, probably in Marco's case, in his situation, he was not overeating either because he was on the hospital bed and the appetite I'm sure wasn't there as, this, as the body is taking care of like, you know, so lessening a little bit of a caloric restriction are, you know, that exercise routine and then activation of the mitochondrial biogenesis and the mitochondria itself, boosting mitochondria then uh, I think that, you know, everything adds up, everything adds up. So I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was sorry, I was going to say, um, and you know, everything you're saying is completely accurate, obviously. And, you know, one of the things that I looked at was, you know, when we're talking about uh, uh, brain plasticity, you know, obviously no one is saying that the brain has the, the ability to regenerate an excised portion of the brain any more than uh, you have the ability to grow a new arm or a new foot. But the brain does retain uh, a certain level of healing capabilities, i.e. neuroplasticity. And, and part of what, uh, what helps with that process is the activation of brain-derived neurotropic factor. 
which of course helps put the cells into a state of axonal genesis. And in some cases, the research shows um, a, a neurogenesis as well. So, um, you know, I, I am fortunate that I have been surrounded by people like yourself and, uh, you know, Dr. Rodarte and, and some of the other folks that are on the, uh, a part of this organization that helped me to uh, have the right compounds and the right level of activity in my body to, in order to maximize whatever that might be to maximize my brain's healing process. Let me ask you a question because now you're teaching me. Is there a, is there a connection between NRF2 and uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor? Are they synergistic? Are they synergistic? Yes, ma'am. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, in fact, there's been a lot of research that just turmeric alone, which we know is in is in the NRF2 uh, activators that we that we take, just the turmeric alone. But the turmeric, along with the with all of the other compounds working synergistically, help to boost that brain derived neurotropic factor. Another thing is, is there a, did you do any specific exercises or something in your recovery? that also kind of stimulates the brain, utilizes and boosting, boosting the mitochondria and everything. I, you know, I, I try to be very versatile in my, in my exercise, everything from uh, progressive resistive exercise, weight training, um, light, of course, I'm not anywhere near as strong as I used to be. And I certainly have to be careful not to, uh, I don't want to, I, I was always concerned that I was going to re-rupture something. Um, that's starting, that I'm starting to become a little bit more daring. But uh, another thing that's really helped me is martial arts. Uh, I'm fortunate that my, Wife is a fifth degree black belt in judo and uh, has competed all over the world. She is. She's she's a tough cookie. And uh, Diana will never say a bad word in your in your presence. <laughs> Me either. That's why I'm so well behaved. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, um, I, I had a chance to, to go into the gym and start doing exercises a little bit at a time. And that certainly has helped me quite a bit. Well, the interesting, thank you. And again, Diane, thank you. So the interesting thing, guys, let's think of the connections. So you have those brain cells and neurons and they have, you know, whatever, arms, arms and legs. So arms and legs are called dendrites or axons. So dendrites are the, those dendrites, like we call them the legs because they bring the information to the nerve cells. Yes. The nerve cells makes this, the, the command, creates the command and the signal. And then through axon, it's like through the arms. Here goes the command, here goes the message. Now, the interesting thing is and that's where being proactive is so important and creating neuroplasticity is so important. When there is a trauma or any event or aging, the dendrites and axons become shorter. When they become shorter, they may not connect to the other cell. So the whole idea of us staying young and then creating the neuroplasticity is maintain those legs and arms very long and very stretchy, very flexible. So that's the part of neuroplasticity. And here, let's say being proactive and now ax axons, I don't know about dendrite, but axons, when they are connected to the brain cell, to the neuron right there, sort of like a bulb of this axon, contains a lot of mitochondria as well. Mm -hmm. So the more mitochondria, the better, the younger. So that's kind of, the, this is, I think to me is a very important part of sustaining the neuroplasticity and working on neuroplasticity through different factors. So uh, sorry for interruption. I, I, and that's what you, now, another thing what we need to think when we talk about the brain, the support. So yes, we have the brain cells, whatever things, and it's interesting how he regained his cognitive functions. And we haven't touched the food yet because I'm, 
I'm sure the food is a huge part of it because I will not be here if not talking about the food. But we need also to talk about the supporting apparatus of the brain. We're talking about, sorry, we're becoming medicinal. We're talking neuromicroglia. And we're talking, let's say, oligodendrocytes. And some of us are familiar with them because those oligodendrocytes, they're the ones that are going to create the shield around those axons or dendrites, which is called myelin. And with this myelin, that's the same thing. There is no myelin. You know, it's like your, your, your coils, your cords. There is no this shield, you know, there is no electricity, right? It's not going to work. So same thing, we need that myelin and that's the supporting upper. So the nerve cells are like kings and queens but they need to be fed, they need to be supported, they need to be nourished. And this is our microglia, this is our astrocytes, and this is our oligodendrocytes. So everything in this connection. Am I correct, uh, Marco, please correct me. You probably know more than that about it. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct on that. And, um, but yeah, I, I, there's really nothing else for me to add to that. I mean, you're spot on. So now, so one thing, so let's get into foods now. So we kind of started backwards. We started NRF2, NRF1, mitochondria and stuff. Now let's get into foods because what I want us to talk, I want him to talk about foods and actually want him to talk about fats because I'm sure fats are a part of the recovery as well. Yeah, so, you know, my diet has always, has generally been, rather clean and I say rather clean because we all know that there's no way that in uh, with the American diet that it can be completely clean uh, but you know part of my part of my food intake is certainly lots of fish and uh, uh, taking those omega oils because we know that of course DHA in addition to everything we've talked about DHA is a building block for for uh, brain function and so I try to keep a high uh, content of fish I'm trying to keep the sugar down. Um, that was something that I struggled with for many years of my life. And uh, so trying to keep that sugar down is certainly important because we know that sugar is, uh, is very acidic and it is uh, counterproductive to, uh, to, to the healing process. Um, and I don't know if that helps, but I, I just, again, it just- totally, It totally helps. DHA is so- so extremely important for the brain health. There is no way around it. Mm -mm. It just, you, we need, and yeah. So, and the thing is, you know, obviously um, uh, being a vegan for so, so many years, uh, even being a vegan, I was on fish oils because vegans in my mind, what I know, I may be wrong, they don't convert properly. They don't convert enough, they convert some to EPA, but then not to DHA. Right. We need DHA, so that's why to me, uh, fish oils is basically, it's almost like medicine because it's an essentiality of our life. Yeah. So, and, and we need, yeah, we need a lot of DHA for a lot of stuff. So that is very, very important. So again, the fish oils. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, no, I'm sorry. What I was gonna say is that, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the fish oil, the DHA uh, is, is right along up there with, you know, we're talking about activating that brain derived neurotropic factor in order to build uh, new neurons in, in as much as, and again, I, I just want to reiterate in case there's somebody out there who's uh, saying, well, the brain can't do this and can't, brain can't do that. We understand that the brain is not able to um, regenerate a, a, an excised portion of the brain. We, we get that. Uh, but it does have those uh, minor or, or more, not as significant uh, neuroplasticity capabilities. And so with the DHA, uh, taking you know, those omega oils and then uh, activating that those chemicals that brain derived neurotropic factor, NRF1, NRF2, 
all of it working together is uh, puts the brain and the entire body in a much better position to be able to heal itself and to maximize its capabilities. And the combination of EPA and DHA, so EPA is going to be like pro-inflammatory. And trust me, when there is a bleed, there is an inflammation. Oh, yeah. So, and I'm sure he had, especially with fevers and stuff, so uh, that this kind of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we kind of covered, yeah, we kind of, we, we covered, guys, for the neuroplasticity, we covered exercise. We covered the food, we covered NRF2, we covered some mitochondria, we covered, covered fish oil, and uh, we, I think we covered some exercise. Now tell us more, so uh, what else? Well, so, you know, the, um, I've had some numerous examinations of obviously, uh, you know, I went to go get an MRI and, uh, the, the, the guy that was uh, reading the MRI was really funny. He, he looks at the MRI and he's going through my medical history and he looks at me and he says, wow, bro, how are you still alive? <laughs> I thought, okay, I wasn't quite sure how to take that. Um, other than, you know, I was, I guess I was happy that I, that I am still alive. But uh, he says, wow, the, the size of your bleed and, and everything that happened, he says, it's just absolutely amazing. And he starts, so he starts asking me questions. Are you able to move your hands? I'm like, yeah, I had some trouble at first, but I can move my hands. I can move my feet. Obviously, I have no problem speaking. And he just shook his head and he thought, wow, what, what an absolute miracle. And I thought that was rather profound that, you know, here's a guy that's looking at a picture of my brain. And, uh, and even he was surprised. Um, you know, at our, at our clinic, my wife and I are both occupational therapists, as you mentioned, and um, at our clinic, we also provide uh, brain mapping. It's a QEEG uh, technology that uses the EEG to take a three-dimensional image of the brain's electrical activity. And so obviously, because I have that technology in my clinic, we did the initial uh, QEEG as soon as we were able to do that. It was uh, about maybe uh, two weeks post, uh, two, three weeks post injury. And uh, we saw the, the extensive dysregulation in the various brainwave activity, both in the frontal lobe and certainly in the occipital lobe. And uh, so I've been doing neurofeedback training as well and uh, doing uh, brain maps from time to time and just kind of monitoring the progress and uh, the, uh, the brain mapping technologist, even he's amazed at how well my brain is progressing from day one to, to where we are now. Incredible. So next question is, tell us about the power of pray, prayer. Tell us about the power of belief. Wow. Well, that's a that's a man that's a that's a tough question and, and I say tough because if you know I don't know what verse it is uh, but you know the apostle Paul while he was in prison the the saints were all gathered and praying for him and that corporate prayer was instrumental in breaking the the opening the doors uh, of the prison cells for Paul to get out. And, you know, and I learned that years ago that the power of corporate prayer is very powerful. Um, there's been a lot of, I, I'm, I'm both a person of faith as well as a science geek. Um, and I've done my research on, uh, on science. I mean, on, I'm sorry, on prayer and how powerful it is for those who have a strong uh, prayer support team compared to people who don't. Um, I could do a whole seminar on that. I won't today, but uh, it was, I do believe that that was one of the contributing factors in giving that type of positive, uh, up, I'm trying to use secular terms here, but positive uplifting energy that uh, was very instrumental in helping not only for me to survive, uh, but also to, uh, to recover. I, I, I just want to say this real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I'd forgotten about it, but I just remembered when we're talking about the power of prayer and the power of faith, when the ambulance first picked me up 
and took me uh, to the hospital there in Brownsville, Texas. As they were wheeling me into the hospital, I momentarily regained consciousness. And I could tell, and I still remember, as I'm wheeling into the hospital, the doors opening up and me going in. And I remember that it was almost um, out of my control. I said, I am not going out like this. And the gentleman who was pushing the, uh, the gurney, he says, I'm sorry, what did you say? Because he was surprised that I was talking to him, right? And I said, I'm not going out like this. And he goes, okay, okay, just, just relax, Mr. Rodriguez. And from that point on, when we were in the hospital and they were telling my wife about the, 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 the probabilities and how, you know, the, the, death, the death rate or the mortality, mortality rate, I guess is what they use. And how my, um, they said that I think it was uh, 14 days or something like that, that they, that they were, that there's a window there. And I remember thinking, okay, well, if they're saying, and I don't remember exactly if it was 14, but I'm just going to say 14 days. I remember thinking, okay, the doctor said 14 days, I'm going for 16. And the reason why I said 16 was because I thought maybe he made a mistake and he meant 15 but I'm going to hang in there and I'm going to keep progressing and I'm going to make it to day 16. And I just remember, uh, you know, the chaplain coming in and, and, and we prayed together. And, and I just thought, Lord, I'm, I, if you need me, great, but I'm not ready to go out yet. I got too much to do still. Which leads me to the, to the next two questions. What is your plan on staying on your path? and getting better. Wow, first and foremost, yeah, first and foremost, uh, I, I believe that I've become much closer to the creative power of this universe and closer to my faith and understanding that uh, I do have a purpose and that um, there is a, there's a power that we, within me that uh, I am continuing to work on to get in touch with. So that is, you know, the, my, my spiritual uh, life is uh, becoming much stronger. And then in terms of my, my mind, my, what I call my soul, which of course the soul comes from the, uh, from the root words, uh, which we get psyche from, psychology from, which is your mind, your emotions, and your will. And so certainly working on that, continuing to uh, do things that are going to improve me in terms of my mind, my will to live, my will to live a life that is uh, giving back to other people, um, making a positive impact on other people, that servant leadership that, uh, that I've come to, to, to know and to dearly love. And then, of course, physically. Uh, I'm going to continue to exercise and uh, get back into, not get back, but continuing to do all of the exercises much slower and, and, and just taking my time, but certainly doing all of the exercises that I needed to do in order to make my body strong. And certainly diet, making sure that I continue to, uh, to have a good diet. I want to say one other thing, and, I'm, and I apologize for going long on this, but you know, people ask me all the time, if the NRF1, NRF2 was so good, why did this happen to me? And the, the fact of the matter is that I've had this my entire life. Uh, apparently I've had this little pocket into in my uh, arterial system my entire life. And th there are lots of, of um, result, or, or research showing people in their 20s and in their 30s who, uh, who get this and never survive. And so I'm fortunate that I, because of the, because of all the extenuating factors and everything that I did beforehand, that I was able to push this back. I am currently 54 years old, but I'm 54, but Sveta, get this. I went to go get my lipid peroxidase, which is very similar to T-bars and my oxidative stress levels and my cellular age came back consistent with a 24.6 year old man even though I'm 54. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it's very exciting. It's unbelievable. And what you said, you know, it's a luck of a draw. It was your anatomy. It was your anatomy to have that aneurysm. And as you said, we're speculating, but your NRF2 protection 
could have strengthened your aneurysm, that it caused that bleed, not the fatal excruciating bleed and yeah. something like that. So basically, you know, what you just summarized, so you just summarized somewhat, now you are on this path, you're creating your legacy. So now you just need to be on stage with the wings all the time and teach and empower us and empower so many in need. Let alone there are a lot of people who do have pockets and aneurysm, but no, people need to hear your story, not only for belief of the neuroplasticity and recovery from the strokes and a whole bunch of other things that, that happen to them, but this is a power of mind. This is a power of a soul. This is a power of a heart. And this is a power of a body. And that's why we're interviewing you because you, you are becoming one of that light of legacy. Now you can give up. Now you can, you just can't go. There you go. This is like, you're there, chosen, you chosen. Well, it's very, you know, it's ironic because I, I always say that whether you know depending on what a person's belief system is whether you believe in uh in, in a god or you believe in the power of the universe whatever you believe in but the, the irony behind the fact that as a therapist i work with brain function i started my career with uh stroke and brain injuries my clinic is dedicated to working with persons who have strokes brain injuries uh children with autism adhd and so we've seen the great results on um, the progress or even in our in in the kids uh with the power of nrf1 and nrf2 but i just think it's ironic that i you know i've dedicated my entire life to helping other people in this in this area and as one of my sons said to me he says uh he calls me pops he said pops you know you spent your whole career talking about and telling other people's story maybe it's time for you to go start telling your own story exactly that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. So I think, guys, we should end on this absolutely positive note on gratitude. Marco Rodriguez, you're just a star. You are, this is incredible. Diane, it just, and to every one of you, and to every one of you who joined us, who joined us not only to hear the story, every one of you joined here to learn to learn and get better. So thank you to every one of you. Thank you. Have an awesome, awesome, awesome evening. And guys, to health, to life, to love. Thanks, Marco. Thank you, Sveta. It was an honor to be here with you today and with, and with your group.